2022, the year a House of Representatives special committee held several blockbuster hearings examining the deadly attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021. Soon, the former President Donald Trump will have to answer for what happened there. And today, we're getting a rare look inside how the insurrection unfolded from a former member of his team who was there. I'm Stephanie Haney, and you're watching In the News Now. On January 6, 2021, the nation watched as a group of Trump supporters stormed the Capitol, trying to block the certification of the 2020 presidential election results. Then, a year later, we all watched as a House committee presented evidence and witness after witness testified about the big lie and Trump's narrative that the 2020 election was stolen. One of those witnesses was Ohio native and former Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews. When she testified about what happened leading up to and during the deadly Capitol riot, Matthew said that the then president poured gasoline on the fire. It was essentially him giving the green light to these uh, people, telling them that what they were doing at the steps of the Capitol and entering the Capitol was okay, that they were justified in their anger. Matthews was one of the first of Trump's team to resign in the hours after the insurrection ended. What's life been like for her since that historic day and what's happened since her testimony? Here's my conversation with the former staffer. You served as deputy press secretary under Kayleigh McEnany during the Trump administration right up until January 6, 2021, the day of the insurrection, which you testified about during the January 6th hearings before Congress. Wild journey to this point. Now we find ourselves in a situation where the former president, Donald Trump, he's facing 91 felony criminal charges, not directly related to that, some of them directly related to that. But before we get into all of that, which we are going to talk about, we do want to talk about your road to the White House and how that started for you. So let's take it, let's take it back to your roots right now. We actually share a hometown. You come from Stark County. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's a, it's a relatively small hometown to come from. You live in Washington, D.C. right now. Did you always want to get involved in politics? No, I definitely did not see myself ever getting involved in politics um, from a young age, but it wasn't really until I got into college that I had an interest for it. I went to Kent State University, joined the College Republicans chapter there, and started working on campaigns. And that was kind of where I uh, caught the bug for it. And then from there, decided I wanted to do an internship in Washington, D.C. for one of my summers during college and interned for um, former Senator Rob Portman and former uh, Speaker of the House John Boehner. And so that was then I knew that I wanted to go to Washington when I graduated and kind of led me there. And then you found yourself in the 2019 President, former President Trump re-election campaign. How did that happen? What was that like getting to that step? Mm -hmm. uh, so immediately after college, I went from uh, college to Capitol Hill, worked for a number of Republicans on Capitol Hill um, in various communications roles. And it was during that time then I was approached about an opportunity to join the former president's uh, re-election campaign. And this would have been June 2019. And um, I said yes. Uh, I was one of the first communications hires for his 2020 re-elect. And spent the next year on the road, traveling all around the country, going rally to rally, working as a spokesperson for uh, former President Donald Trump. And it was during that time, Kaylee McEnany was working on the campaign as well. And we struck up a close working relationship and friendship. And they decided they wanted to move her from the campaign trail to the White House where they thought she could be more effective. And she asked me to come with her and join her over there as her deputy. So in June of 2020, I joined her over at the White House and worked there for the last seven months of the administration. Now you mentioned you spent a lot of time traveling around when you were working on the reelection campaign. You live in Washington, D.C. now. I have to ask you, being a North Canton girl, Canton girl myself, you're home for one day. Where are you going? What are you eating? What are you doing while you're home? Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I think every time I come home, um, my parents and I go to dinner at Bender's and then we go get a Bittner from Taggart's for dessert. And so that would probably be my ideal uh, day and night with my parents, just having dinner and uh, a Bittner. <laughs> Bender's fries. So good. You can't beat the Bender's uh, fries. They're incredible. Mm. I'm a pizza oven girl myself, which is right around the <laughs> corner. I always get the pizza oven JoJo's thinly sliced. It's the only oh. way to do it. 
yeah, they're, that is delicious as well. So yes, I have my cravings and <laughs> definitely always make sure to get my fix when I'm in town. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be able to have that, you know, place to come home to. And then from Canton, from Kent, you're on the campaign, you find yourself as the deputy press secretary, you find yourself testifying before Congress later about January 6th. One of the things that led up to that, though, was seven months that you spent working for the press team there. So can you tell me a little bit about what it was like when you started in 2020 on the press team? I always like to tell people that I think all four years of Trump's presidency were crazy and chaotic. I think the last seven months though that I was there was probably the most tumultuous period. I mean, when I joined, the COVID was resurging. Um, George Floyd protests were happening around the country. Um, we had a Supreme Court justice pass away um, and then we had to fill that seat. Um, the president got COVID then the election happened, then his efforts to try to overturn the results of the election, which obviously ultimately led to January 6th. And those are just the highlights that I can remember off the top of my head. But it was a really crazy period of time to be there and to have a front row seat to that kind of history. And um, it, every day was something different. You're, you were always putting out fires. I think doing communications for a president, of course, it's gonna be crazy. But I think for that president specifically, where it felt like he was almost sometimes working against what we were trying to do, because we could have a whole day planned for media and then one tweet could throw it all off. So um, it was definitely a, um, a very interesting experience, but I think it helped make me a better communicator. I can tell you, speaking from someone who was here in Northeast Ohio while this was happening as well, one of those tweets <laughs> changes the whole changes the whole assignment for the day. Whole news cycle changes, <laughs> exactly. We would be about to go out for a briefing. Um, Kaylee McEnany would have a whole thing prepped, a whole binder of facts prepped, and literally seconds before we walk out, sometimes he would fire off a tweet, and we'd have to kind of prep and uh, come up with an answer or response for what he had just sent out. And so definitely made um, our job a little difficult. But Sure. Well, certainly we know how your position there ended with your resignation on January 6th. Can you talk a little bit about what it might have felt like, did, how the mood felt during the seven months that you were there? Was there a marked change leading up to January 6th or just the overall feeling? I think prior to COVID, um, when I was working on the 2020 reelection campaign, a lot of people felt very confident that Trump was gonna be reelected. And it wasn't until COVID hit and the economy, which was his biggest selling point, kind of took a um, downward turn. And so then people started to think, ah, he might not win because people aren't very happy with his COVID response. And so then I think th there became that doubt that um, it, this isn't guaranteed, that. Joe Biden could pull this off. And by the time the election happened, obviously I was at the White House and I kind of knew on election night when I saw the results rolling in that this wasn't gonna go our way. And uh, I think a lot of people that I was working with didn't want to accept that fact and um, were a little bit delusional thinking, oh, but there's still more votes to be tallied. And I think I saw on election night the way that Georgia was trending and I knew that there was really no chance then that a Republican uh, candidate could pull it off and pull off a win without that state. And so once the election happened, I wanted to give the president um, the ability to fight the results in court, um, which he did, and thought he had a right to pursue that litigation. But it was always my belief that when that litigation failed, that he would then proceed with a peaceful transition of power. And obviously that didn't happen. And so I kind of was disturbed by his efforts to try to overturn the election, but was trying to just be loyal, stay on until the end. And then January 6th obviously happened. And I, I could not sit by and be silent any longer. And I knew I was gonna resign um, when that video came out, when the president put out a video after we had seen all the um, riots and destruction and these folks fighting with police officers and attacking them. I remember thinking when he tweeted out this video response, hopefully he's gonna say the right thing. Hopefully it will be the right message and he'll meet the moment. And in that video, he said to these people that um, we love you, you're very special. 
and he was talking to the rioters who had just watched deface our capital and brutally attack police officers and chant things like hang Mike Pence, his own vice president. And that was the moment that I knew that I needed to resign and I wanted to make a statement. So I resigned that evening after informing my loved ones of my decision and then put out a statement um, urging the president for a peaceful transition of power. I remember you speaking before Congress about that video and you talking about what a moment that was for you. One of the things you mentioned was that as a spokesperson, you knew you would be asked to defend that statement when he talked to those rioters and said, I love you, you're special, that kind of thing, and made no differentiation between the people who were there peacefully and the people who were not there peacefully. So that was clearly a very poignant moment for you. Were there any moments that felt maybe not to that degree, but felt difficult for you working for President Trump leading up to that point? Yeah, there were definitely, being a spokesperson for him, obviously there were things he said and did that I didn't always agree with 100% of the time, but I think you'd be lucky to find a boss that you agree with 100% of the time. In general, I would love that job, especially in politics. You're not, you're there serving at the pleasure of the principal. And so in my case, that was President Donald Trump. And Yes, there were definitely times where I had heartburn about things that I had to defend, but at the end of the day, I was there because I believed in the overall agenda. I believed in the policies that we were enacting. And I thought he really did put a lot of good people in positions of power. And so no, of course, yeah, I didn't agree with everything, but um, I think there was a very large difference between some of his poorly worded tweets in the past and that day of January 6th. I mean, people lost their lives as a result. and. I felt like that was indefensible, in my opinion. Let's talk about that day now, January 6th, the insurrection. You know, you were in the building in the months leading up to that day. You were there that day. Do you remember how that day started for you personally before things went the way they went? Yes. I. I arrived that morning and I remember that he was going to be doing a speech um, on the ellipse. and it was gonna be the last Trump rally while he was president. And it was absolutely frigid that day. It was so cold outside. And so I remember telling my colleagues, I've seen a million Trump rallies. I don't care to go. I don't need to see it. And they convinced me. So I ended up walking over from the West Wing to the Ellipse, um, which is near the White House grounds, and um, watched the speech from the side of the stage. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. And a lot of what he said in the speech were things that I had heard before, but I think a moment that really stuck out in particular to me was when he started attacking Vice President Mike Pence and saying um, that you know he needed to have the courage to do what was right and kind of painted a target on his back in that speech. And then the other thing that stuck out to me was when he said that we were gonna march to the Capitol because I knew there was absolutely no way that Secret Service would ever allow him to do that. And so once the speech concluded, I went back to the West Wing and it really wasn't long after that, by the time I got back to my office, that I saw the images on TV of folks arriving at the Capitol and kind of having these altercations with police officers and it looked like it was gonna get out of hand really quickly. And I remember just urging the press secretary at the time, Kayleigh McEnany, who had the president's ear, I told her he needs to tweet out something and tell these people to be peaceful and tell these people to respect our law enforcement and to get away from the Capitol. There needs to be a call to action. And she tried her best, as did many other people that day, but he was very hesitant and reluctant to send out any sort of message. And the only thing I can infer from that is that he enjoyed what he was seeing then, which is really disturbing to me. When you walked back from being at the side of the stage there, did you have any kind of inkling of what was to come before you saw those things as they were unfolding on television? I really had no idea what was happening at the Capitol by that time I was walking back because I know that people during his speech started making their way to the Capitol. And 
unbeknownst to me, I was looking at the crowd and the immediate crowd that was assembled right at the front of the stage was peaceful. And so what I saw, I, I had no idea that violence was about to unfold. I had also been, um, I, I did not realize that there were speeches leading up to the president's where people were using rhetoric to try to rile up the crowd. I remember Rudy Giuliani gave a speech right before the president went on and he was saying things like we needed to have a trial by combat to try to overturn the election. And uh, that kind of language obviously doesn't help, I think. And once you get in that mob mentality, I think, um, that yes, there was a group of these people, largely what I saw were peaceful supporters, but then a group broke off and made their way to the Capitol. And obviously they were not peaceful and they were violent and attacking police officers, defacing our nation's capital. And that uh, it was upsetting to see. That was my next question for you. Beyond what you clearly felt as your responsibility as deputy press secretary, when you told Kaylee McEnany the president needs to tweet something, how you felt just as a person there in that space who may have been scared, worried, any of those things, being in that space while that was happening. Yeah, I, prior to joining the Trump administration and the Trump campaign, I worked on Capitol Hill. That was where I got my start in politics. And so it was really upsetting to see a building that I hold so near and dear to my heart under attack. And what was even scarier was I knew people inside that building. I knew people who were scared for their lives because they were hiding in their offices from these folks who were storming the building. And that was really upsetting. And so it was frantically sending texts to people to make sure they were okay. And so, yes, I was trying to operate in my capacity as deputy press secretary that day and stay calm and figure out what the response was gonna be and how the White House was gonna handle it. But then on a personal level, I was really scared for my friends and I was devastated to see this building, an institution that I love so dearly under attack. To me, his refusal to act and call off the mob that day and his refusal to condemn the violence was indefensible and so, I knew that I would be resigning that evening. Describe what it felt like when you officially, you know, after you spoke with your loved ones, hit send or made that phone call or sent that text or whatever it was to actually submit formally your resignation. It was really tough because at that time when I knew I was going to resign and making those phone calls to the people at the Trump White House to inform them of my decision, no one in the administration had resigned yet. and. I ended up um, making those phone calls and then chose a reporter that I trusted and gave my resignation statement to him. And um, right before he released it to the public, um, someone else in the administration resigned, which was Stephanie Grisham, who was the first lady's chief of staff at the time. And we were not particularly close during our time at the White House, but I think that common experience of kind of going through um, resigning on January 6th and speaking out against the president has brought us close together and now she's a dear friend. But she resigned and my resignation came out shortly thereafter. And so we were two of the first people to resign, which was very scary to do. And ultimately we ended up seeing cabinet secretaries resign as a result. And so it was very daunting and I also felt like I was betraying my friends in a way because these were co-workers of mine that I considered friends and I knew that they were going to be really upset with my decision but I knew in my heart that there was absolutely no way that I could walk into the White House gates the next day and act like everything I witnessed was fine and so I don't talk to a lot of people that I worked with at the White House and as a result because they see my resignation as a betrayal but that's okay because I'm at peace with the decision that I made. Did you have any idea? at that moment when you were handing in that re resignation that you would then later be called to testify before Congress about what happened that day? I don't think I personally realized it in that moment, but I actually was talking to a reporter um, that evening who was a friend and they actually speculated that to me. And so that evening after I resigned, they said, this is probably going to turn into some sort of investigation and you're gonna get dragged into it for doing the right thing. And um, 
and it's funny now looking back on it because they were exactly right. But I don't I don't know if I necessarily believe them in that moment because I was still processing everything that happened. But I don't think that I would have guessed when joining the White House that a couple of years later I would end up testifying against my boss. When it was happening, when those hearings did unfold, I can tell you here, we were all glued to the television, you know, wanting to see what had come together from that investigation. What was that process like for you, though, leading up to that, knowing you had been called to testify, preparing for that, and then actually sitting there that day and speaking before all those people? Yeah, so my initial contact with the committee was Liz Cheney reached out to me through a friend and asked if I would be willing to come in for an informal, off-the-record conversation. I ended up going and meeting with just Liz Cheney for around four to five hours and just kind of told her everything I had witnessed at the Trump White House in the lead-up to uh, the election, after the election, and up to January 6th. And I kind of thought that that would be the end of it honestly. And I thought, okay, I'll give them some good leads that they can run down in their investigation. And then they came back a couple months later and asked if I would sit down for a tape deposition and basically have the same conversation just with the camera recording. And so I was obliged. I was sympathetic to their cause and agreed to do it. And not a lot of other Republicans were as willing to cooperate as we saw with folks defying subpoenas and things. So I ended up sitting down for that tape deposition, and I knew that they had said that there were going to be public hearings, but I didn't necessarily think that I would be one of the witnesses called. And um, a couple months after that, I believe it was in May of 2021, or excuse me, in May of 2022, mm -hmm. they came back to me and said, so we'd actually like you to testify before the committee in one of our public hearings. And I was really scared. I think no one expects themselves to be put in that position. Uh, when I resigned from the White House, I was 25 years old. When I testified before Congress, I was 27 years old. And I felt like I had my whole career ahead of me, and this was just altering that course uh, very quickly. And I knew that this was a decision that was going to impact me and my career prospects. I knew that it was going to impact me financially because hiring lawyers is really expensive. And then I knew that speaking out against Trump world in a, such a wide platform like that would put a target on my back and sign me up for harassment and threats and vitriol. And, and that, that's really scary to know that you're facing that. And as I did, but all the other witnesses who testified did as well. And so, I knew it was the right thing to do despite all of my fears and concerns because I felt like the American people deserve to hear the truth because a lot of Republicans were not telling them the truth, which was that January 6th was not just people coming in and touring the Capitol. They like to say that and whitewash the events of that day. Or they like to say that, oh, well, the election was stolen or it was fraudulent or what have you. There's zero evidence of that all of Trump's litigation failed. And he has never produced a single shred of evidence to, to support any of his election claims. He lost the election. And a lot of Republicans are not willing to say that. And a lot of Republicans are not willing to say that January 6th was a horrific day for our country and that Donald Trump caused it because of his refusal to accept the results of the election. Those people would not have been at the Capitol that day if Donald Trump had not tweeted out that they should go. He was tweeting out in the weeks leading up that it was gonna be a big day, and I, those people were just listening to him and following his marching orders. So while it was a really big decision to go forward with testifying, I knew it was the right thing to do um, for the American people so that they could hear the truth from someone who was on the inside and working inside the Trump White House. Leading up to that, you know, the pushback that might come because there were people, like you said, that were not making these factual claims. They weren't admitting that it was an insurrection. They weren't admitting that the election was not stolen. In reality, afterwards, did you get any pushback from people? Yeah, I got a lot of pushback from people. Um, people that I was once friends with who um, were attacking me online 
and saying that I was a liar and a pawn for Pelosi and I was only looking for 15 minutes of fame when that couldn't be further from the truth. I think that a lot of these people privately hold the same sentiments as me, but are afraid to say so publicly. I think they know deep down that there is no proof that the election was stolen or fraudulent. And I think that they agree that the events of January 6 were horrific, but they want to move on from it because they don't want to upset Trump or his allies. And they're more concerned with their own personal ambition than they are for doing what's good for the country. And so in that moment, I chose to put my country over my party because I felt like that was what the American people needed to hear. There's definitely something to be said for acknowledging the truth of what happened in an effort to move past it and get to that space where we can all heal. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, did you get any unexpected praise or maybe expected praise or any positive feedback after you did such a brave thing and really put yourself out there? It was definitely, I think, a mixed reaction online. I think there were a lot of people who thought that I was a traitor and um, were attacking me. And then there were people who were praising me, saying I was a hero and brave and courageous and all this stuff. But honestly, I tried to just tune a lot of it out. Um, I, I think that even if you see you know, five positive tweets, you'll read that one that's really nasty and awful and it sticks with you. And so I remember my boyfriend was with me in the aftermath of testifying and he wouldn't let me look at my phone or turn on the TV for days. So I just tried to tune it all out and move forward with my life and um, not listen to any of the you know, trolls or people attacking me because um, at the end of the day, I am happy with the decision that I made and I'm at peace with it. And so I don't need to hear or listen to any of the negativity. But it is kind of funny then when you have people who are praising you, because in my view, I look at it like, no, I, I just did what I think any good person would do. But all these other people are just cowardly. And they're not, I had to testify because there were people who were higher ranking than me at the White House, who knew way more than I did, but were too scared of Donald Trump or too concerned with their own um, ambition and job prospects to come forward and tell the truth. And so then it put myself and others in a position who were much younger than them to have to do that. And so I, I, it's funny when people say that though, but it doesn't really resonate because I just think that any normal sane person would have come forward after witnessing the events of January 6 and shared what they knew. But I guess that's Washington for you. More people are concerned with um, their own jobs and ambition. It's funny what you mentioned about the negative comments sticking out to you. You know, that's, there's science behind that. It's like something like for every positive experience or for every negative experience, you need three to five positive experiences <laughs> to offset that negativity. We are kind of hardwired to remember the negativity and you did certainly experience a lot of it after that. So thank you for what you did. No, what thank that's you. Worth. Thank you. Thank you for doing the thing that was required to be done and being that person who was willing to do that. Thank you. Now I am wondering, in your role as deputy press secretary, that's a very prestigious role, not necessarily the most front facing role, mm -hmm. though. Did the former president reach out to you or have any contact or comments or anything that you took note of regarding what happened when you testified? He issued a statement. No one from Trump world or the president, a former president himself tried to reach out to me, but um, they clearly had contacted all of their allies and kind of given them the talking points of here's how we're gonna attack her once she testifies. And before I even opened my mouth to testify, people were tweeting things about how I was a liar and I looked at the timestamps. I'm like, oh, that's funny. You didn't even hear what I had to say yet. But the president, after I testified, did issue a statement basically saying something to the effect of that he didn't know me and um, that I was just doing this for 15 minutes of fame. But what's so funny to me is that if I wanted 15 minutes of fame, I resigned on January 6th. I could have gone and done any media interview I wanted. I had all these big media outlets knocking on my door, um, asking me to come on and do interviews. And I chose not to because I didn't want my resignation 
to be viewed as that. I didn't want it to be viewed that I was trying to get any sort of fame out of it. I wanted it to be a message that the president had failed that day and that we needed a peaceful transition of power. And I wanted that to speak on its own. And then it was funny to me, too, that he said that he didn't know me. And that's often an excuse he uses with anyone who says anything that he doesn't like um, about him. And there are photos of us together. He would talk to me about um, if we were having a briefing that day. Maybe he didn't always remember my name, but he definitely knew I was on the press team working under Kaylee McEnany. And so he, he can try to claim that, you know, I, don't, I didn't know what I was talking about or anything like that, but I was working in the West Wing for seven months and um, was there on that day. And so he can't deny that. Well, the pay stubs prove it, right? <laughs> you were there, you were part of the Trump administration. Now we find ourselves today in a situation where we didn't know what would happen immediately after January 6th, but we know a little bit of what's happened now. And now rioters have been charged and tried and put in prison. We find ourselves in a situation where the former president has racked up 91 felony criminal charges in four criminal cases in Washington, D.C., New York, Florida, and Georgia. And in the January 6th federal election interference case, these are the charges that he faces. Conspiracy to violate civil rights. Conspiracy to defraud the government the corrupt obstruction of an official proceeding and conspiracy to carry out that obstruction. You were there that day. What do you think about those charges? I'm no legal expert, so I can't really comment on the charges themselves, but I do believe that there is a large amount of evidence to support them. I mean, look, we saw what the January 6th committee uncovered, and they didn't even have all of the resources available to them that the Department of Justice does. And so I believe that we need to let this process play out, see what facts they've gathered. But I do believe from what we already know that their case is very strong against him. And also at the end of the day, no one is above the rule of law, not even a former president. And so I think that this is the correct decision. He needs to be held accountable for what happened. When you did testify before Congress about what happened on January 6th, one thing that you mentioned after being on the campaign re-election trail with him was how his followers really hang on his every word. They hang on his ever social media post. Now this week, the judge in the January 6th case imposed a limited gag order on the case. You know, it's widely understood that it's directed at the former president. It is against all parties that are involved in the case. And so that prevents them from disparaging prosecutors, witnesses, and court personnel. Now, we know that Trump's team is appealing this. They say it's a violation of his First Amendment rights. Based on what you know and the gravity of the situation, what do you think about that limited gag order in this case? I've always believed that Donald Trump got into the 2024 election because he wanted to be a political candidate so that he could spin all of these legal troubles that he knew were gonna catch up to him. He could spin it as these are politically motivated and then say that it's a violation of his freedom of speech because he should be allowed to campaign and talk about these things with voters that he's trying to court. And so it all looks very orchestrated to me why he's running. And that is because I think that he knew that he was gonna be facing these legal troubles. And so, I think this is the correct decision. Um, we've seen what happens when Trump and his allies uh, tweet out things or truth social things um, about people that he's upset with. I mean, the first people that come to mind were some of my fellow um, uh, witnesses who testified before the January 6th committee, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman. These were the Georgia election poll workers who they said were part of some conspiracy where they were switching out ballots. None of it was true, but obviously the far right um, and online trolls ran with it in these conspiracies when there was no um, basis to them. And it ruined these women's lives. They literally like weren't able to leave their house. They were um, scared for their lives. They were getting death threats and um, basically had to become recluses. And so that is why this gag order is put in place because Donald Trump doesn't care about how his words um, affect people. And they have very real consequences and impact on people's lives. And so I think this is the correct decision. I think it's only a matter of time before he violates it. He can't help himself. And I'm curious to see what will happen when he does violate it and um, what actions and consequences there are for him.
there are certainly several things that could happen if he does violate, if and when, as a lot of people say, he does violate. It will be interesting to see what the judge chooses to do in that case when that comes to pass, if it does. Uh, some things that you had mentioned as we've been talking here were some of the concerns that a lot of people experienced about career issues after being involved in the Trump administration. Now, we know part of the story of what happened to Trump after January 6th. He's facing federal criminal charges because of that. But as this is going on, he is still the front runner for the 2024 Republican presidential candidate nominee. So in that regard, we start to think about what are the real consequences to this. You know, as the trial plays out, we'll see what happens there. But what happened for you professionally after January 6th, after your resignation? Um, yeah, it definitely, I think, became a little bit difficult. Um, I was working on Capitol Hill at the time. Felt like it wasn't necessarily sustainable for me to stay after everything that had transpired. So I ended up leaving and joining a consulting firm. And now I get to work on clients that I pick and that I'm passionate about and um, help them with communications. But I think it will be a long time before I'm able to go back to politics if, if, I, if I choose to. And probably not until Trump is um, out of Republican politics, just because of the way that things are. As you mentioned, he's still the front runner for the Republican nomination. And so speaking out against him, you know, definitely uh, limits my ability to work in Republican politics. And, and that's OK, because I think if there are folks who wouldn't want to hire me for what I did, then I probably wouldn't want to work for them anyways. And I'm at peace with that and know that that is um, something that I needed to factor in when making the decision to testify. But like I said, at the end of the day, uh, that's OK. And I think the other thing that has kind of come from all of this, too, is being given this platform now where you're kind of put in the national spotlight and with everything going on, I have been doing interviews like this and able to talk about these things and uh, speak more broadly about it and get it out to an audience because I don't think that enough Republicans are out there saying the truth and doing so in a public fashion. And that's that the election was not stolen or fraudulent. There's zero evidence of it. And that January 6th was largely uh, uh, happened because of Donald Trump's refusal to accept that uh, uh, result of the elections. So I'm. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at is that I want to be able to use the platform that I've been given to speak about these things publicly. When you speak about the potential about getting into Republican politics, you know, long term, short term, whatever, what that might look like. Looking at the field right now, is there a Republican presidential candidate who you might be open to or maybe interested and excited about working with? I think I don't know if I would necessarily go hop on another 2024 campaign right now, but there are definitely candidates in the field that I'm excited about. I think the person who excites me the most and who we've seen momentum from as of late is Nikki Haley. I think that she is someone who in the debates is giving the most substantive policy answers. She's shown a willingness to go after Trump, but she knows that she has to walk that fine line because she still needs to appeal to his voters. And I also believe that she's actually running to be president. A lot of these other folks in the field are not running to be president. They are running because they want to be picked as Trump's vice president or they want a nice plum position in the administration, in the cabinet. And to me, then they should just not be in the race. And that's what's frustrating is that Donald Trump is leading the field by a wide, wide margin right now. But that's because he has a lock on about 40 percent of the base. That leaves about 60 percent of voters who are open to a Trump alternative or will never support Trump. And if someone could actually coalesce that support and be in a one on one matchup against him in a primary, I believe that he could be defeated. But there are just too many people in the field. And so if those folks actually wanted to defeat Trump, um, then they would drop out and I think throw their support behind someone like Nikki Haley, who has the momentum on her side, who has the experience to lead and who has shown a willingness to take on Trump. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen at this point. The current president, Joe Biden, has said that he is running for reelection. What do you think about 
the potential of a possible 2024 Biden-Trump rematch? I think many Americans would agree with me with this sentiment that this is essentially the rematch from hell. No one wants to have these two old men running against each other again. I mean, look, Biden is 80, Trump is 77, and I can't believe that we're having this rematch. And I think that there are better options on both sides for people. And I, but unfortunately, that it looks like we're gonna have a rematch. And I wish that Republicans would put up another option because I think that if we ran anyone else against Joe Biden, our odds of winning would go up considerably. But I think if we run Donald Trump against Joe Biden, not only is Donald Trump a risk to democracy, in my opinion, but I also think that he could risk losing to Joe Biden again. He's already done it once before. And I, I, I don't really want to see um, another Joe Biden uh, presidency, but if Donald Trump's the nominee, then unfortunately I don't think um, I'll have much of a choice in who I support and vote for. But I think a lot of people are really unhappy with the direction and current state of our country and the world and everything that's going on. And putting, uh, I feel like putting Biden in office for another four years is a risk that we can't take, but it's a lose-lose scenario for a voter like me where I don't really want either option. Now you worked for the Trump communications team. Seeing what you've seen from the Biden communications team, do you have any comments about how they're running things in the Biden communications shop? Um, I often think that doing communications for a Democrat politician is 10 times easier than doing it for a Republican, just based on, I feel like, especially the Washington um, media and the White House um, press pool, sometimes they uh, tend to go a little bit easier, it seems like, on Democrats. So maybe that's just my personal um, opinion and uh, bias there. But I think that um, they largely aren't having to do as much because Biden isn't as um, almost he's not in the media as much per se. He kind of runs almost like how he kind of ran a basement campaign operation in 2020. He isn't as active in the White House and oftentimes not holding as many um, press engagements and media interviews. He rarely does um, national media interviews. And so probably makes their lives a little bit easier, but also I do not envy the position that they are in right now where there is a lot going on in the world. Um, obviously we had our own struggles when I was at the White House dealing with things like COVID and global pandemic, but with them, everything that's happening with the war in Ukraine, the war in Israel, um, I have to imagine that it's very chaotic for them. So I, I wish them the best, but I think that usually working for a Democrat tends to be a little bit easier in terms of your um, press coverage. One more question for you today, Sarah. Just had my high school reunion, Perry High School, class of 2003. Assuming you're going to your high school reunion, you know, since you've been there, you graduated from Hoover High School, you went to Kent, you graduated from Kent, you've done all these things. Are your former classmates, are they surprised to see what's happened in your life over those past years? I've definitely received some um, text messages and Instagram DMs from former classmates of mine who will be like, hey, I just saw you on CNN or things like that, which is really funny. Um, but yeah, I don't think a lot of them would have expected me to be where I'm at now, um, having worked at the Trump White House and um, doing things like testifying before Congress. I don't think any of them would have expected that. Uh, in high school, I was the editor in chief of our yearbook and was oftentimes with a camera doing photography. And so I don't think that anyone would have necessarily envisioned me um, being in the position that I am now. You know, what's funny about that is you're probably in a lot of other people's yearbooks. You're probably in some 2022 yearbooks <laughs> after testifying before Congress now. That is a crazy thought to think. I. I can't even like fathom that. That time capsule in the news sort of thing. Yeah. Sarah, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. This summer, more than a year after the January 6 hearings began, a federal grand jury in Washington, D.C. indicted Trump for his role in attempting to overthrow the results of the 2020 presidential election. The indictment charges Trump and co-conspirators with taking a series of illegal actions to try to keep the former president in power. Stay with us as we continue to cover that criminal case as it moves forward. 
For now, thanks for being with us for this edition of In the News Now. I'm Stephanie Haney.